Um, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're really excited to be officially launching the low end of market rental housing monitor. I'm Annie Hodgins. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm the executive director of the Canadian Centre for Housing Rights. And I'll be facilitating the session this afternoon. And we're so happy you took the time from your schedules to be here. Um, just a quick note that we're recording the session um, and it'll be shared with everyone who is registered um, following the session. And also before we review the agenda, we're gonna start with a land acknowledgement. So we recognize that our work and the work of our community partners takes place on traditional Indigenous territories across Canada. We're grateful to be able to work and live on these territories, which includes 634 different First Nation communities, 53 Inuit communities, and eight Métis settlements. We're thankful and honored to collaborate with the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people who have cared for these territories throughout their history and who continue to contribute to the strength of Canada and to all communities across the country. Um, and it's particularly important for us to reflect on this as we discuss a project that's based on the idea of home and on mapping regions. I'll just quickly review our agenda so you know what to expect today. I'm gonna to introduce the tool and then my colleague, Daniel Liadsky, Managing Director from Purpose Analytics, will discuss how we defined affordability in the tool and provide a demonstration of how to use the tool. And then following that, our colleague, Adam Fraser, a data scientist from the Ontario Nonprofit Housing Association, will review a data story that highlights the kind of local insights that the tool is able to provide. Just in terms of um, the background and uh, why we undertook this initiative, I wanna speak to that. Um, so as we're all aware, a lack of affordable rental housing has resulted in a crisis in communities across Canada. Among the millions of people who are affected, lower income renters are facing especially alarming difficulties securing a home they can afford. Affordable private market rental housing is a critical component of the housing spectrum. These rentals provide homes for low wage workers and households with fixed incomes in particular. And because of a chronic lack of investment in and support for affordable models like co-ops and social housing across uh, decades, the low end of the private market is increasingly relied on by equity deserving communities. Um, at the same time, there's a dearth of data related to housing across the spectrum in Canada, and even where it exists, the data is mostly not widely available, scattered across regions, and the quality varies significantly. So the impact of a data gap like this is significant. It means governments are forced to develop policies and programs without adequate understanding of where to focus resources or an ability to evaluate the impacts of current policies and programs. With our national conversation focused on increasing housing supply, um, CCHR and our partners are particularly concerned about the rapid loss of existing affordable housing and the need to preserve it. As an organization that provides direct legal services to renters facing housing insecurity and eviction, CCHR is acutely aware that when residents of low end of market rental housing lose their homes, they're more likely to become homeless. So the Lemur uh, Rental Housing Monitor is filling an important gap by providing open access data that allows us to track and understand what's happening to the low end of market rental housing stock and the people who rely on it. So before I describe the tool in more detail, I'd like to introduce the project partners. First of all, we're grateful to CMHC, Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, who provided support for this through the Housing Supply Challenge. Um, and at the Canadian Centre House, for Housing Rights, where I work, we are a nonprofit charity that has been proudly advancing the right to housing in Canada since 1987. And we undertake our work through advocacy, community engagement, serving renters, and undertaking research. Purpose Analytics is a nonprofit uh, focused on building a data informed non nonprofit sector, helping organizations put their data to good use, and connecting people working with data across sectors. And the Ontario Nonprofit Housing Association is an independent association funded and directed by its members. ONFA leads, unites, and supports a strong community based affordable housing sector that helps build vibrant, healthy, and diverse communities for all Ontarians. 
And our and Shiny developer, Sharla Gelfin, focuses their work on creating tools that enable the public, po public policymakers and scientists to more easily access, understand, and make decisions with data. So this was truly a community effort. And I want to acknowledge and thank our 118 contributors as well. Um, the project drew on the expertise of a steering committee, which was consulted throughout the project to provide guidance on key questions related to data, housing policy, and community engagement. Um, this included the BC Nonprofit Housing Association and the Community Housing Transformation Center. Um, I also want to shout out our key expert advisors, Steve Pomeroy, who is a leading voice on housing in Canada with over 35 years of experience and a particular focus on affordable housing and urban development, and Jens von Bergman, a data scientist with a primary focus on data infrastructure and data visualization and how it can aid in removing barriers and solving problems. We also relied on a regional advisory group of volunteers from civil society organizations working in the selected cities. There were 48 regional advisors who provided critical region-specific advice on policy, information gaps, and challenges, and the realities faced by their communities. We also consulted with six major municipalities and undertook data investigations across 60 regions. And I think it's important to talk about this collaboration as a cornerstone of the project, because in order to gather and share crucial data in an effective way, we need to continue to work together across communities and sectors moving forward. So what is Lemur? Um, the Lemur Housing Monitor up integrates 18 years worth of data to demonstrate changes to the quantity, typology, condition, location, and affordability of the existing private market affordable rental housing stock in six urban regions across the country. It aggregates data from 23 sources across 2006 to 2022 and includes data from Statistics Canada, CMHC, provincial governments, landlord and tenant boards and residential tenancies branches, municipal and regional government administrators and agencies. And the data is displayed uh, through interactive regional maps that visualize the data um, and data stories that highlight key insights from the data. And the Lemur team will continue to develop those insights in the coming months. So where is, where is Lemur located currently? Um, the goal is to provide open access and easily searchable information that will enrich evidence-based decision-making in the regions it covers. Currently, um, the, the tool ha has been located in Calgary, Greater Montreal area, Greater Toronto area, Halifax, Metro Vancouver area, and Winnipeg. Um, and so for the first time, it's presenting an amalgam of critical information about uh, the housing stock in those areas. And as I said, it can be scaled and, and, and expanded to different regions, which is our intention. Um, so key trends that the tool can, can, can show, and we're going to see some illustrations of this later today, um, it can provide a variety of insights. It covers trends impacting affordability and provides contextual information about regional differences and changes in stock across time. So these include the location of affordable housing types and their change over time, estimated percentage of market rental units that are affordable, trends in evictions and vacancy rates, the location of new housing developments, the number of renter households and percentage of their percentage of the total population, the percentage of renters in core housing need as defined by Statistics Canada, building and neighborhood characteristics, access to amenities, apartment building features and evaluation scores, building permit activity, um, and then what, what rental options are available in different neighborhoods. And before I hand it over to my colleague, Daniel, just a few words about the usefulness of the tool and our hopes for the tool. The Lemur Housing Monitor can be used across all sectors that have a stake in preserving existing rental housing to prevent homelessness and ensure Canada meets its commitment to fulfilling the right to housing for everyone, um, as our government committed to in the National Housing Strategy. So the tool has the power to support true evidence-based planning and program evaluation in communities across the country. 
It can help government and policymakers to identify trends in affordable housing and to monitor the impact of programs and policies. It can help urban planners to evaluate whether municipal land use planning tools are sufficient to ensure a diversity of rental stock in communities. It can also support their decision making related to inclusionary zoning, rental unit replacement policies, and rental property acquisition initiatives. It can help housing providers better tell their story as a stabilizing force for preserving affordable rental housing in their communities. It can help municipal departments and frontline workers and service providers to identify potential hotspots of housing precarity and need in their communities to help people on the ground. And finally, it can support the work of housing advocates by providing an evidence base for data informed policy alternatives. And we hope that this is only the beginning. The model is scalable, both in terms of expanding to new regions and adding and aggregating new data layers. So our team um, will also be working to, to analyze the data and create new insights in the coming little while. And we'd love to hear from anyone interested in collaborating with us in future to expand the tool. And now, um, without further ado, I will hand it over to Daniel Liadsky, our wonderful partner from Purpose Analytics, who will walk us through how we defined affordability in this context and, and provide a demonstration of the tool. Great, thank you so much, Annie. Uh, and before I start, I, I just also wanna say it was a very interesting project for us, uh, not just because this is a, such an important topic, but uh, because of the collaboration, the partnership, uh, bringing data scientists across three nonprofit organizations together, along with the support from our uh, data scientist consultants. Um, so I'm going to start with the, the affordability uh, piece, uh, and if we can go to the next slide. Um, one of the first things we had to do was uh, decide uh, how we were going to define affordability for this project. And the, the problem facing us is that there's no standard definition for this uh, in Canada, and that makes comparing uh, cities against each other or uh, comparing over time uh, challenging. Uh, so we had to come up with a, a definition that we thought we could apply consistently uh, and, and over time. Um, we looked at, at some of the other measures that uh, other provinces and, and cities are using. Um, many of them uh, remain uh, market-based measures and market-based measures uh, tell us how the, how the market is doing, but they don't necessarily tell us uh, whether people have enough money to afford uh, those units. And in theory, market-based can be fine if income and rent move together at the same pace. Um, but uh, you'll see on the charts on the right, um, sometimes that happens and sometimes that's that's not always ca the case. The uh, purple lines show the uh, change in rent over time for primary market units and uh, secondary condo units and their, their average rent. And then the green lines show uh, adjusted income for um, uh, couple families and also people who are not uh, in census families. Uh, and so we see it, it varies uh, quite a bit by, by city. Um, I guess the other reason that we uh, decided to uh, craft a, a special definition for this uh, project is uh, the other uh, definitions that we saw sometimes were developed specifically for uh, particular housing programs and policies. And so they were crafted through the lens of what, what might be uh, needed or, or feasible from um, the the uh, policies of, of the day, but not necessarily uh, for looking at um, looking at this issue through the lens of tenants and uh, and being able to monitor affordability over time. So uh, we saw some areas for improvement, and uh, and so the first one is to align our definition with renter income. And the chart on the right uh, shows us that uh, there's there's actually quite a difference between. Uh, renter income and owner incomes. Uh, and so if we look at affordability just as income as a whole, we sort of lose uh, track of the fact that uh, renters uh, already are on the lower end of the, the income spectrum. So when we're talking about affordable units for the, the lower end, we take into consideration the people who are actually renting those units and the rent and the income available to them. Um, that's a, a, a more representative of, of what will be affordable. Um, the other thing that we wanted to consider is that affordability matters depending on uh, the size of the family. And we know that uh, larger families and especially families that can have two income earners tend to have higher incomes. And so although it's it's great that, um, you know, there's been reporting on the average market rent in, uh, in various cities or 
uh, other reports that have talked about the number of units that might be under, say, $1,000. What this doesn't take into consideration is that uh, $1,000 for a single income earning uh, tenant is, is very different from a, a, a multi-income uh, family uh, in terms of what, what's affordable. And then the last area for improvement was to take a look at uh, asking rent as opposed to average market rent. Uh, and asking rent is really telling us what the cost is to rent a unit right now. Uh, and to get to this, we used the census to approximate uh, asking rent by looking at the, the mobility question in the census, which can tell us essentially the rent for units that turned over uh, in recent years. A census does actually have a measure for the units that turned over in the last year, but to increase the sample size for this project, we looked at units that, that turned over in the last five years. So we'll get to the, uh, the next slide. I'll show um, the specifics of our definition. So uh, what we looked at is uh, the 30 percent uh, of the median renter economic income, uh, rec economic family income, and the 30 percent will be familiar to people as a conventional um, rule of thumb for, for what is affordable uh, shelter, shelter costs, costs for any uh, uh, family size. Uh, and we chose median, um, looking at the, the middle of the income spectrum, because historically, if we go back 15 years, this was when we uh, where renters reached an equivalency threshold, where they were able to access the portion of the market that matched their purchasing power. So uh, to explain that more currently now, renters in the middle of the income spectrum uh, cannot access or afford 50% of the rental market. They have their purchasing power uh, gives them access to a much smaller slice of the market. And then lastly, the, the definition considers unit sizes. And basically we, we come up with a, um, a, a, an equivalency of, of a unit size to match the, the family size. And that's how we, we come up um, with, with different thresholds for each of the uh, family sizes. So this will be uh, clear on the next slide, and we'll just walk through what um, affordability looks like for both one-person and two-person uh, families. So uh, what we're showing on this slide is uh, the rent thresholds um, for each family size across the different cities. And so you can see how they, they vary across the cities, which takes into consideration that the income and cost of living is, is variable uh, regionally. Um, and we can also see that one person households, are, our suitability is that one person household um, uh, will be looking for a bachelor unit or a one bedroom unit. Of course, they can occupy larger units, but for, uh, for working out the threshold, we're looking at, at those two sizes. And then the two person family is looking at a one bedroom unit or a two bedroom unit as, as suitable for, for their family size. So based on this, we can see that one person households and two person families are both um, competing for the same one bedroom units, uh, but their uh, affordability, the, what they can afford is different with the two person family, sometimes uh, nearly double what the, the one person households can afford. So we'll focus on the one person household um, just because th this is sort of the area that uh, through th uh, the, the tool we've, we've seen that has the, and just through I think our general understanding, we've seen where uh, the, the greatest pressures are on affordability. So on the next slide, we'll see what that uh, looks like in terms of the percentage of units in the market uh, that were affordable uh, in 2021. And so we can see uh, across the country, all of these are, are below 50%. Uh, some of them uh, very much so. Um, and then we can look at how this uh, compares to uh, 15 years ago in 2006, um, just on the next slide. And so we can see uniformly across uh, all the regions, um, there has been a, a market decrease uh, in those percentages. And uh, just to, to show you uh, what uh, those rents uh, using the same um, definition what those thresholds looked like in 2006 dollars um, 15 years ago. So this is the trend that, that we're seeing. The, the definition su uh, supports um, sort of all the news that, that we've been hearing about uh, the um, erosion or, or disappearance of uh, affordable, affordable units in, in the marketplace. So uh, that, that's the run through of the definition. Um, now I'm going to walk us through uh, a bit of a demo for the site itself so we can look at how to uh, use the, the, the map and the tool. Uh, next slide, please. 
Okay, so um, we're here at the uh, Lemur Loam uh, homepage, which is at uh, lemur.ca, L-E-M-R.ca. And right away, we uh, provide people with access to uh, some data stories that highlight findings from the data. And it provides a guided analysis for you to gain quick insight uh, into the data so that you don't have to crunch the numbers yourself. Um, the, it's also provides some examples of different ways in which the data can be used. And they range in content from a look at big picture trends to a neighborhood level analysis to documenting the challenges and barriers that our team faced while trying to access the data itself. Uh, Adam Fraser will be walking us through one of those examples in just a bit. So moving on to the data maps, uh, six regions are available across Canada and the data maps themselves are comprised of a viewing area and a sidebar where you can control the interactive elements and review the summarized data. By default, we're showing our composite measure for rental affordability by census tract and the darker areas here in Winnipeg show where uh, affordability is most challenged. And as you over, hover over the geographic areas, you can see in the bottom right, um, uh, summary information about the statistics for each area. There are several controls in the sidebar that can be used to change what is displayed on the map. Wherever an information icon is displayed, you can open a tooltip to read definitions. The uh, geography toggle allows you to switch between levels of geography and see the data at higher levels of aggregation. And uh, you can see that in action here. Uh, forward sortation areas show geographic representations of the first three characters of postal codes. And then rental market survey zones are larger areas that are used by CMHC to report results from its rental market survey. And municipality shows administrative boundaries for local governments. And in some regions such as Winnipeg, there's just one that spans the entire region. To change the layers that are visible on the map, you can choose between a base layer and a building layer. And the, build, the base layers include estimates for the affordable rental stock uh, as a comp composite measure, as well as by family size. It also includes information about uh, market unit types and where available, we provide other contextual layers such as primary market vacancy rate, uh, core housing need, evictions filing rates and building permit activity. Building layers are available only in regions where building level data were accessible. And these display the individual buildings as points on top of the base layer. And when the buildings are displayed, you can uh, select the points and bring up an info window with details about the selected buildings. Using linkages on standardized addresses, we're able to show building level details across multiple data sets. And to show this in action a little bit more, we'll switch to Toronto here, uh, which was the richest source of, of building level data. So in Toronto, uh, we have information about the size of the building, the evaluation score from the city's rent safe TO program, the number of evictions filings by year and by type from the provincial landlord tenant board and the building permit activity from the city's planning department. You can also change the year displayed. The map includes data that spans a range of years with some data sets going back to 2006. When a data set is not available in a particular year or at a level of geography, the text will be grayed out and you'll get a little warning uh, if uh, it is not uh, displayable. Um, to focus on a single geographic area, uh, you can either select an area directly on the map or use the drop down menu or address search function in the sidebar. Geographic areas can be uh, then deselected in the drop down menu or you can uh, click this link to uh, return to the, the overall area. Below you can see the sidebar is changing the summary statistics for the selected region. Uh, here we're seeing the estimated stock of, of affordable private rental market uh, units for each family size. And we can see that one person households face greater affordability challenges than larger families that are more likely to have dual incomes. Below the section, we estimate the distribution of rental units by market type. And we can see that primary market units uh, here in red only supply a portion of the total rental market. And then below this section, we provide additional summary statistics, which provide context for the data above. These include population and household characteristics, uh, other details about the rental stock and evictions filings where available. So we do have more detailed information about the data sets and the, their definitions are accessible from a link uh, above the map. And then we also have links uh, to the data itself. 
again, uh, just above the map where you can go to our data portal and download the data directly uh, or access it programmatically through an API or R package. Um, so thanks for, for bearing with the, the walkthrough uh, of, the, of the site itself and hope you will uh, hop on and, and click around uh, yourself too. And if you want to contact us, you can do so through the contact form uh, on the site. And uh, with that, I'm going to uh, pass it over to Adam Fraser from the Ontario Nonprofit Housing Association to walk us through one of the data stories. Adam. Thank you, Daniel. Hi, everyone. I'm Adam Fraser. I'm with the Ontario Nonprofit Housing Association. Uh, we are also very grateful to be um, partners on this project. Uh, so I'm going to walk you through one of the data stories we have published on our website. And this will showcase some of the ways that you can use the Lemur Housing Monitor to identify communities with precarious affordable rental housing and also show some of the things that you can learn about particular communities. So first slide there, please. So for this, I'll be speaking about an area with, uh, within the community of Spryfield, Nova Scotia. So Spryfield contains two main census tracts which are geographical areas established by Statistics Canada. And they typically have between uh, 2,500 and 8,000 people. So we will be looking at census tract number 2050002, as it contains a fairly substantial portion of privately owned purpose-built rental housing or primary market housing. Uh, so just a quick background on this before we, uh, we get going. So this community is just outside the Halifax Peninsula, which is Halifax's urban core. Uh, it's located at the bottom of the map displayed here, um, kind of shaded in turquoise. What might be difficult to see is that this community is separated from the Halifax Peninsula by an inlet. Uh, the community has a population of approximately 8,300 people and approximately 1,450 renter households. It's an area that uh, historically has been known for affordable rental housing and an accessible location for low-income households. And most of its purpose-built rental stock was created in the 1970s and mainly consists of low-rise apartment buildings between eight and 24 units. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so now I'd like to explore some of the data available in the Lemur Housing Monitor and demonstrate a, a workflow that you can follow, uh, which is beginning with a high level view to detect communities with distinct or precarious affordable housing, and then zoom in to learn more about the uh, housing profile or qualities of that neighborhood. Uh, so first beginning at a, a high level view here, uh, we can take a view of all communities across Halifax and see which ones stand out in terms of the a percentage of units that are affordable. So again, Lemur allows you to display this by different bedroom types or household sizes. But in this instance, we're looking at units suitable to one person households, uh, so zero or one bedroom units. And this map shows um, regions with higher percentages of affordable housing um, with darker colors of purple. And there are three regions in uh, Halifax that had a percentage of affordable units greater than 60%. And one of these corresponds to the uh, selected census tract within Spryfield, uh, which again is down at the bottom of the map there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this figure here also displays percentage of affordable housing for one person households and shows census tracts with greater percentages of affordable housing towards the right of the graph. Uh, and this shows our um, region of, of focus at third highest, um, with an estimated 61% of zero and one bedroom units being affordable to uh, single person households. What this figure also shows us are regions that lost a greater percentage of affordable housing since 2016 with larger losses towards the bottom of the graph. Uh, so what we see is uh, that not only does this community in Spryfield offer relatively high availability of affordable housing, but it's also an area that has been experiencing a tremendous amount of loss. 
and uh, in fact, the most uh, loss across all Halifax communities. Uh, so this implies that this community might be uh, an area of interest to zoom into and try to gather a, a deeper context. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so now I'd like to start looking at a bit more specific details and evaluate what additional context we can gather on, on what happened here. The first, what we see here is that although the percentage of affordable units is decreasing for all family sizes and bedroom sizes, the, uh, the loss of affordable housing is really most salient for one person households, or again, zero and one bedroom units. Uh, and uh, there we see a fairly substantial decrease of 39%. So it appears that this pressure on affordability isn't uniform across all bedroom types in this region, but it's particularly connected to zero and one bedroom units. So this loss might not be attributable primarily due to uh, an acute increase in demand, as you might expect a more uniform loss of affordability with particularly high demand pressures, which might be a stronger force in more central Halifax communities, such as those in the Halifax Peninsula. Uh, next slide, please. And here what we see is uh, that the construction of new primary um, rental market units essentially halted after the 1970s, and the rate of construction fell uh, far behind other regions of Halifax. Next slide, please. And so Lemur also allows us to look at specific primary market buildings and learn some of the history or characteristics of that particular stock. So here what we see is, uh, we see the primary market buildings in this community and um, that they're not just old as shown in the previous slide, but there are also some uh, issues being flagged with some of the stock. So the dots on this map show the presence of primary market buildings and the ones highlighted in green uh, indicate that a residential standards violation uh, or maintenance or safety concern has been reported to the city. There are several buildings that have had multiple different uh, violations filed. These are the ones with the uh, with the larger markers. And to the right, this shows that this community has had a higher rate of residential violations filed since uh, 2020 than any other census tract in Halifax, with approximately one filing for every two and a half primary market buildings. Next slide, please. Another thing that we see with this purpose-built stock is that there's a very high frequency of sales transactions. So this map highlights buildings that have had at least one sales transaction since 2019. And when we look at the number of sales as a proportion of primary market units within each census tract, our census tract within Spryfield ranks fifth across Halifax with almost one sale per every two primary market units. Next slide, please. All right, so what we have seen with these last few slides is that there are some distinct activities happening with the buildings in this community, which coincides with a very acute loss of affordable housing relative to other communities in the region. And although we can't differentiate between whether rent increases were driven by genuine expenses or by competitive market conditions. This relationship between particular buildings and loss of affordable housing can be explored further by evaluating other data sources made available through Lemur, such as building permits, uh, property valuation changes, and evictions, for instance. Uh, and just to end by summarizing a few more of the takeaways from the Lemur Housing Monitor, and the capacity to perform certain analysis like this. Uh, so on one hand, uh, here we were able to take a high level view and determine through rent data from Statistics Canada that this region had a fairly uh, special and precarious affordable rental stock. And then through uh, municipal and provincial data, we were able to take a closer look and evaluate building history and activity 
which is also distinguishable from other communities. So in this instance, this could suggest that affordability is closely tied to specific buildings, more so than in, in other communities, such as those that experience affordability pressures primarily due to acute widespread increases in demand. This distinction could suggest there would be a benefit to a more targeted intervention in a community like Spryfield, which focuses on the preservation of its existing affordable housing, uh, as opposed to the more generalized strategies that might be applied in areas facing stronger demand-driven affordability pressures. Uh, and finally, I, I think the very local level detail provided is one of the strengths of the Lemur Housing Monitor, as it allows users to not only detect hotspots for vulnerable affordable housing, but also in cases evaluate the influences uh, of that loss of affordable housing that might be unique uh, by different communities. Uh, and uh, we hope these features serve as a very valuable tool in the hand of local housing planners and housing advocates as they uh, address affordable housing preservation. Uh, so thanks a lot for your time. Uh, I also encourage you to visit the uh, data stories page on our website, lemur.ca, where you can find more analyses like this. And I'll now pass it back to Annie for concluding remarks. I believe you're uh, muted there, Annie. Thank you so much, Adam and Daniel. Um, and as mentioned, uh, we hope this is just the beginning of a journey to ensure better and more data is collected and shared across the country. And we know there are others working on, on similar projects and, and we're really excited about um, the opportunities to work together. Um, and so if anyone does uh, does sort of want have ideas about that, please don't hesitate to reach out to us as well as while you're exploring the tool. There is a, an opportunity on the site to reach out with questions and queries. Um, and so just before I now open it up, there's time for questions and we've had some questions coming in. Um, uh, before I do that, I just want to thank again uh, the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation for seeing the value in the project and funding the initiative and thanking our many partners and collaborators. Um, we're really looking forward to continuing the work with everyone. And also thank you um, for to everyone that took time out of your busy days. Uh, there is a lot of work going on in the housing sector and we really value your time. Um, we had many people registered and, and we're just grateful for your interest and support. So now we're going to take some time to answer your questions and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can in the time we have before 1 p.m. Um, available to answer your questions. Maybe the, the folks can just come on, on, turn on their cameras for a minute just while I introduce people, but available to answer questions are Daniel, um, Adam, who just presented, and we also have CCHR's data scientist, Megan Earle, and Charlotte Gelfand, uh, the web developer, who are also available to answer questions. So I will just uh, start with, with uh, some of the ones that have come in. Um, so the first question I'll start with is, um, why did we choose these six regions? And can Lemur be expanded into other areas, which it can be? But in particular, there was a question about um, rural areas and, and what that might look like. So I just wanted to to ask that um, if, for whoever was was going to answer that one. Uh, I can jump in on the on the rural areas question. Um, so uh, I th I think it's a it's definitely a, an area that uh, is important. The uh, availability of data is quite different. Um, and so the um, type of approaches that we were using for this project um, uh, would, would need to be adjusted to, to look at uh, rural information. Uh, there's also been some work done uh, in Ontario by the Rural Ontario Institute on uh, rural housing information as well. So I didn't encourage you to, to look at what they've done as well. Great. Thanks, Danielle. And we've got, uh, did you consider using data, oh, apologies, what data is included related to ownership of buildings? And we also had some questions about accessibility and, and what data was included there. And I think, Adam, I can hand it over to you on that one. 
Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so yeah, we really tried, um, really interested in trying to segment out some of the, some of the buildings data that we presented um, to display rental, whether it's private for profit or non-market housing. Uh, that was some of the, some of the data that was, had more inconsistencies uh, across regions as we relied on municipal data sources for that. Uh, some of the non-market data did have uh, much better quality data related to uh, ownership, whether it was um, a private nonprofit or if it was uh, like a local housing authority, like Toronto Community Housing, for instance. And they also had better better data on building accessibility and uh, wheelchair accessible units. The uh, the data for that was strongest in the city of Vancouver their non-market data, as well as Toronto, since they have, uh, or the city of Toronto rather, since they have um, the uh, rent safe program that does uh, building evaluations. And so they have really good data on uh, ownership and property management when it comes to non-market housing, as well as building conditions and some details related to accessibility. Uh, but that is a gap that we would like to, uh, like to fill in across the other regions. Um, and hopefully find some improved uh, data sources for that. Great, thanks, Adam. And I oh, and lastly, Sarah, we we have um, the amenity density score for each region, uh, each area, and all of the Lima regions. Uh, that's provided um, from Statistics Canada, and uh, it evaluates the the proximity of different amenities like uh, grocery stores, uh, healthcare facilities, pharmacies and child care facilities, for instance. Um, so that's some information you can find, uh, not building related, but community related that you can see in, in all the regions. Great, thanks Adam. And we are getting some questions about different regions and different cities and whether the tool could, could come there. And the answer is yes, it, it definitely could. I think one of the big considerations in choosing up uh, locations was was the availability of data um, and a few other factors. Um, but there's a couple of questions that came in that I think, Daniel, I might hand it over to you. So there was one that was, did you consider using data from CMHC's rental market survey for turnover rents? And then what's the number or percent, like what percentage of units would we have liked to have seen that were affordable, deeply affordable? Yeah, so the the first one on the uh, rental market uh, survey, uh, it's it's a wonderful data point that was recently added to the rental market survey. So at the time that we were compiling Lemur, we we didn't think there were enough years to uh, uh, to to make a um, it, it meaningful in uh, in the tool right now. But in the future, we would certainly want to to bring that data in uh, on a regular basis. Um, and then the question about what is what is a number that we would like to see? I think that's a question about targets for uh, affordable housing. That's that's uh, um, not something that I think is a data driven answer. That's uh, a policy and, and values answer. So that's not really the uh, the goal of of this project. But the the really what we're hoping is that uh, you know if there are communities that that have a target in mind that they can use this tool. Uh, to measure their progress to towards those targets, and if they see, uh, you know, if they if they introduce new policy interventions to be able to see whether that's moving the the needle in the right direction. Great, thanks, Daniel. Um, so we've got: uh, Does Lemur include all units in rental tenure, including things like secondary suites and houses, rental condos, units above Main Street, commercial buildings? or only units in apartment buildings? And I think, Adam, we were gonna ask you that one. Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, so for each region, uh, our target was to uh, segment all rental uh, units by either if it's um, private for profit, primary market, um, or secondary market, further breaking secondary market down into uh, condos and non-condo. And lastly, non-market. Um, the non-market portion was again dependent on the availability of municipal data. So there are some regions where 
we weren't able to break down the total um, total rental stock into all of those segments. And there was a bit of a, an unknown category there. Um, in terms of some of the more specific housing, like uh, secondary suites in particular, uh, and also uh, boarding houses in instances, um, that's displayed, that, that was much less available in municipal data, but it's displayed where it was available. So you will see it in some regions like um, like Brampton, there's some secondary suites, um, Surrey, and for boarding houses, I think uh, Calgary, Winnipeg, and Halifax. Um, but again, that's more data that we are hoping to be able to, to fill in and get some of that more uh, specific stock mapped out. Thanks, Adam. Um, we've got a question. Are there any insights offered on unit turnover or length of time tenants stay in an affordable unit and how this contributes to the loss of available units? And Daniel, are you are you able to speak on that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think there are pieces of, of information and in, uh, that, that can help to answer that question. So in, in a number of the regions, we've, we've published uh, data on evictions filings. Uh, evictions filings don't necessarily tell you whether um, uh, it's a forced turnover or not, and that, that turnover or not, and it doesn't necessarily tell you about all the informal uh, evictions that, that take place. So that's uh, obviously one source of uh, turnover that, that people are concerned about. Um, and then, uh, you know, we have, um, we have this information about uh, where the, uh, these, the percentage of units, uh, and you can basically infer turnover if you see the percentage of affordable units uh, going up, because you need, a, or at least in most jurisdictions with uh, where there's rent control, you need a turn turnover for the rent to go up. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, it's hard to answer it outright um, uh, across the entire market. Um, there was mention earlier about the rental market survey and their turnover measure, which would tell you about that within the primary rental market. Great, thanks. And there's a question um, about how we plan to update the data. Will it be done on an ongoing basis? Um, is it expected that municipalities will take it over? And that's a, you know, we're, we're working on that question. Um, CCHR and Purpose Analytics and ONCA have been working together on this and we're sort of deciding what the right cadence for updates to it would be. Um, so so we'll, we'll keep people posted um, and we are very much open to partnering with municipalities who might find this type of project um, interesting and helpful to them. So I think that there could be a variety of approaches there. Um, so I just wanted to provide that background. Um, Another question, um, is your open data, e.g. stats can being drawn directly from the source or are you downloading and creating your own databases? And um, I maybe Daniel, I'll throw it to you again, although anyone else who would like to jump in, absolutely feel free. Yeah, um, so uh, most of the, the data is, is coming from an original data source and there's a transformation process that it goes through to uh, spatially integrate and connect the, the data sets together. Um, the one piece that is custom is we have a custom tabulation from a statistics scan before the census that allows us to get the counts at the, the thresholds that, that we asked for. Um, and I, I mean, I think the, um, important piece to highlight sort of under in the behind the scenes of this this project is a, is a data pipeline that uh, allows us to re-ingest data as it gets updated um, so this isn't uh, this isn't like a traditional research project where you know the researchers uh, did a lot of manual labor and put out the the data and they would have to redo that all over again to uh, keep the the site updated we've we've built this for um, with, with, with this kind of sustainability in mind um, to, to be able to uh, take data sets as they're updated and then uh, refresh the, the tool. 
great. And we had a question that was particular to Vancouver, but I think it speaks a little bit more broadly to availability of data and, and how that impacts the tool. So for Vancouver CMA, I noticed that the only purpose built rental buildings that are mapped on the map are in the city of New West. Will this be mapped for other municipalities? And so just that question of, of the impacts of availability, maybe Megan, I'll, I'll hand that to you. Sure, yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. So uh, the purpose of the Lemur Housing Monitor was mainly to aggregate and integrate existing data. And so the reason that you're seeing, you know, certain data only available for certain areas is because those cities provided data um, that allowed us to do that. So the hope is that we will be able to update the tool as new data becomes available. So if new data is collected by municipalities and made available for that purpose, then we would be happy to add it in the future. And that's that's what our hope is. Yeah, thanks, Megan. And, and, you know, at some point, there might also be learnings about what data is missing, and then and then that can inform initiatives to make sure that there's more data collected, that it's useful, and also that it maybe it's more uniform across jurisdictions. Um, so we've had a few questions about tiny homes. Um, one, of, one of them is I'm conducting a tiny house research study, and I was wondering if tiny homes were considered in the data, or if not specifically tiny housing data, what was what housing size was housing size considered as a factor? So I'm not sure if someone can can kind of jump in on that one. Uh, yeah, house uh, house size was not um, a factor on our end for what we wanted to include, and, and we would love to have that sort of data uh, included for sure. One of the kind of trends that, that we uh, witnessed with municipal data sources, which we relied on this again. Um, is a tendency to um, just suppress data for smaller housing types. Like for instance, some non-market housing um, would choose to uh, like limit data to a certain household size, like over five units or um, just uh, apartment buildings rather than townhouses. So I think that might be a challenge for us that if it's a municipal data source that we're relying on, they might not want to uh, provide things such as tiny, tiny homes data. Great, thanks Adam. Um, I think we've answered most of the questions that sort of had a, a broader implication. And then I think there's a few more specific questions about the data that our team will be able to answer um, later on. So, Unless there's a there's a burning final broad question anyone wants to add in, I think maybe we can leave it there um, for the day. But we so appreciate um, everyone taking the time to attend. We hope that you'll use the tool and get in touch with us um, about any any questions you have or or ideas about uh, collaborating. Um, we're we're very open to hearing from all of you and. And uh, we're, we're very open to, to working together to, to get the data that we need to improve housing for everyone in the country and making sure it's affordable and that everyone can access it. So thanks so much. And thanks to this amazing team that we had the privilege of working with. It's been, it's been fantastic. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Bye.